Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna get started. The first thing I would like to say is that this is, you know, this issue of CUAs is a, um, so I'm just spotlighting myself here, so it's, okay, the recording. Um, I know this is kind of a, it's a controversial topic and it, it causes a lot of stress in people and sometimes even panic, you know, anything to deal with our livelihood and money obviously can be stressful. So um, I'm just really asking that everyone just be patient, listen to everybody, you know, we're going to have differences, but just be respectful and listen to everyone and, you know, everyone will have a chance to share his or her opinion. Hopefully, um, I want to keep this to an hour, if at all possible. I know a bunch of people have other commitments. Uh, we may go to 6.15. I can't really go any longer than that because I'm doing the book club meeting. So uh, we may need a second meeting if, if we can't cover everything. Um, I am going to do the opening presentation and I'm going to move through things kind of quickly because I want to, you know, I, I want to cover a lot in this one hour and I want us to have time to talk at the end and ask questions. So if there's something that you have a question on, I would ask you to you know, either put it in the chat and if you're afraid you're going to forget it or just wait till, till the presentation's over. And then Nick will come on if there's anything I've forgotten or anything he wants to highlight, um, he can do that. And then he'll help answer questions because Nick actually has a CUA for this year. So he's in a good position to you know, answer a lot of questions about it as I don't have one. So but I've been researching it very extensively. So <laughs> I'm going to share with you everything I found out. So if everybody could mute themselves, I hear a little bit of a clattering or something. So if you could mute yourselves, that'll just help with so the recording is clear for everyone. All right, so let me share my, let me share my screen here with you. Hmm, that's interesting, here we go. All right, can you guys all see my screen? Yeah, we're good? Okay. So first of all, this link here at the bottom, this is, um, or at the top, is the link on the website for the CUA, on the you know Park Service website. And I think I will probably just send this handout out or I'll have a link to it in Judy's next email. So if you wanna have these links, you can either copy them down or you can ask me at the end, I can put them all in the chat. I don't like to put them in the chat now because people that come in late can't see that. You only see the chat from when you come on and I'll just have to keep putting them in. So I'll wait till the end. If you want any of these links, just ask me at the end and I'll put them in the chat. But it is on their Park Service website so you can read about it. And then, well, first let's just say what a CUA is, right? This is a commercial, commercial usage authorization. And it's basically for guides who are taking people onto national park territory. So which sites is that? It's this one here. So let's see if it'll, let me open it here. So no, I have it open already. I'll show you. Just stop this one. Why is it not opening for me? Boy, sorry, I probably should have made slides, but. I don't think, oh, it's not green. You guys aren't seeing this yet. All right, here we go. So these are all of the sites that are covered in. So it's basically anything, you know, it's not just Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. You have the Independence Visitor Center. I mean, not, I don't think they're going to look for your CUA in there, but Independence Square buildings, Liberty Bell Center, Franklin Court, Second Bank's not open now, President's House, City Tavern not open, Pre-Quaker Meeting House, almost never open, <laughs> but it's open sometimes on the weekends, Merchants Exchange, and you know, I don't know how strict they are when you're outside these places, Certainly, if you're inside Independence Hall on the park territory, if you're inside the Liberty Bell, they're definitely going to be looking um, these other things. I don't know. I don't know how strict they're going to be about it. Uh, a lot of these aren't even open. 
If you're out in the mall outside of Independence Hall talking about it, my guess is they're probably not going to bother you. Um, but Andrew isn't going to actually say that, right? Because technically, anytime we're on park property, we're supposed to have a CUA. And the CUA costs, just get back to my little handout here. So you can see this little um, chart here. If you bring in up to 300 people in a year, then you just pay the $300 fee. So the $300 is the fee for the CUA. You also have to have insurance to get the CUA, but we'll talk about that separately. But you need $300 gets paid to the park service in order to have a CUA. So the first 300 people that you bring in are considered free. Now, to me, it seems like you're paying $300 for just for 300 people, but technically they consider it that they're free. Now, if you bring over 300 people, anywhere up till 5,000 people, it's $1,000. I'm hoping we can talk to the park service. Maybe there could be some leeway in there. Maybe they could make an intermediate step. Maybe up to 1,000 people could be free. And then after that, the $1,000 fee would be assessed. Um, he, I did talk to Andrew at the Park Service and he did say, look, if someone has 305 people, I know nobody wants to lie on a federal form, but I would just put 300. Now he said 305, what if you have 450, right? I don't know. So uh, one thing I do wanna say is that APT can't tell you what to do about this. We can just give you all the information that, that we've collected and you have to kind of decide for yourself based on what kind of tours you give, how many people you have in a year, where you go on your tours, how much you can afford to pay for insurance or for the CUA, and then make the best decision for yourself, right? Kind of assess your, your risks, you know, based on what you do and decide what's, what's going to be best for you. Um, so right now I'm just talking about what the park requires. And then we'll talk a little bit about who, who this actually applies to of us. But this is the chart. So if up to 300 people in a year that you would bring in, it's considered included in that 300 park service fee. And then anything over that would be an additional $1,000. And then the calendar there, you can see this is, they're, they're kind of giving us a break this year because of COVID. So this year you would pay the $300 fee and it's good for 2022 and 2023. And normally it's $300 every year, but because of COVID, they're kind of giving a little bit of a break here. So it would be 222 or 2022, $300, and that would roll into 2023. Now, what happens is at the beginning of the year, you pay the $300 CUA fee. And then at the end of the year, you tell them how many people you had that year. And if you had between 300 and 1,000 or 5,000, you have to pay the additional $1,000. So the additional $1,000 is due at the end of the year. So they call that their monitoring fee or their management fee. So what they're doing to give us a little bit of a break this year is that in January, 2023, you wouldn't pay the 300 again, because we're, you know, it'll be, it'll be included in 2022. And you wouldn't have to do the annual report until July. Now you'd still have to pay it if you had a thousand people or, anywhere over 300 up to 5,000 in 2022, you still have to pay it. They aren't discounting that, but you would, you would have until July to pay it instead of paying it in January or December, if that makes sense. So they're giving you a little extra time to pay it. So if the guests numbered over 300 in 2022, then you pay the additional $1,000 fee. And then in January, 2024, you're gonna pay the 300 CUA fee again, and you would submit your report for 2023. And if in 2023 you had between 300 and 5,000, then you would pay the additional thousand dollars then when you're making your payment. Does that kind of make sense? Um, you know, if you have questions, I can go over it again at the end, but that's, you know, and then January, 2025, you're going to pay your $300 fee again, and you're going to report, give the report for 2024. And if you had over 300 people, then you're going to pay that additional fee. Now, if you get a CUA, and when you do what this annual report is, they have a form on their website 
It's called the 10660. 10, you can see it down here. Um, and basically, you have to keep a statement. You have to have your gross receipts, so how much money you made on those tours, the ones that you booked directly and took into the park. So if you don't book them directly, you don't need to include them. If you don't go into Independence Park, you only did city hall tours or something, then you're not, you're not counting those. And then they say visitor use statistics and resource impact assessments. Um, and I have one. Well, at the end, if you have questions, we can go over it. But basically, you want to keep good track of your tours. So how many people for each tour, um, what your, you know, how much money each tour was, how much you made, and if you paid for any vendors during the tour, and keep track of all of that. And then you also have to say, like, what percentage of your tour included the national park. So you have to kind of guesstimate that. I know, it's really weird. Um, but let's not go over that yet because that's kind of that's kind of an extra thing that's at the end of the year when you do a report. So if you want to and we have time, we can look at that at the end. Uh, it's called the 10C60. Um, so who who would have to pay this? So you're supposed to have a CUA if you take tourists into the national park. Now a lot of us work for tour companies. You know, we're independent contractors that are just hired to be a tour guide for that tour company. And the tour company is advertising, is, you know, booking the tour, doing everything about the tour, and we're just giving the actual tour. In that case, the, the other company that we work for has to have a CUA. So if you work for Philly Tour Hub or Free Tours by Foot or Centipede or, you know, any of those kind of companies, that company has a CUA. And they're giving you one, you know, your own badge to carry on you while you're doing the tour. So in that case, if that's all you do, then you wouldn't need a CUA. But if you're someone who gets hired directly from a customer to do a tour, not through, you know, another company as an independent contractor, then you should have a CUA if you go on national park property. Now, if you don't go on national park property, if you only do tours other, elsewhere in the city, then you don't need to do it. If you don't actually go inside Independence Hall, you know, on the territory of Independence Hall going through security, if you never go inside the Liberty Bell, you know, your, your chances of being checked for it are going to be less, but technically you're still supposed to have it if, if you're on the property of the, of the Park Service. Um, now, some of us um, do big groups, like I might get hired directly by a big group to do a tour. I mean, I have in the past. Um, but then that big group has insurance, right? So technically they should get the CUA, right? If it's a big tour operator that's coming to Philly, if they just come once, maybe they expect you to have it. I mean, you kind of have to talk to the, you know, who's hiring you to see, to see about the CUA. If it's a big company and they come five or six times a year to Philly, they, they should get a CUA, right? They already have the insurance anyway. It's not a big deal for them to pay the $300 to get this. Um, so that might help you out if, if that's the only kind you do. Um, so if you have more questions about that, you know, jot them down. The insurance, the park requires you to have insurance. Now, when I talked to Andrew, he's the, you know, the guy at the park service who, who deals with the CUAs. He, um, he was kind of like, look, if you're running a business, you really should have insurance, right? That's kind of his take on it. Um, I've been looking into insurance last week, this last week and these past couple days, and I don't know why it's so ridiculously expensive. Although, as Nick says, what kind of insurance do you expect for a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars a year? Um, you know, I don't know what other businesses pay for their insurance, but we'll go over at the end what some what some insurance people here at APT have actually found. Um, but what you need is general liability insurance naming the United States of America as additional insured. Minimum coverage amount is $500,000 per occurrence. Now, Andrew told me that he made a concession for us because when we first had the meeting with him about the CUAs, the minimum coverage was a million dollars. And some people complained that that was really excessive. So he got a change to $500,000. It actually doesn't matter because it's not that much more to get insurance for $500,000 or a million. So, but he did do that for us. He is trying to work with us. 
Um, but in the big scheme of things, it doesn't make that much of a difference for us. Um, so what I did here was copy from the CUA application everything it says about insurance. And that's basically all you need to know. You have to give the park a copy of the above insurance. You know, you have to give them your, your, your certificate of the insurance. You have to submit that with your application. And the insurance company must be rated at least A minus. So not too much, not too complicated with, um, with the insurance. Now we offer insurance through ABT, through our national organization, the NTGA. So a lot of you have that insurance or some of you do that with that $99 a year insurance that we have. Technically that's not good for getting a CUA. And the reason is it doesn't cover us when we're acting as tour operators. So if we look at, let's see if I can pull up, um, this, stop this for a second. I'm going to pull them up on the um, on the website so we can take a look. I think I can pull it up on my own. Hold on. I'm going to share this with you. Q&A. All right, so this is the Q&A doc from the website. And again, I have those links and I can send them all to you afterwards, but they're on our website. There's a fact, you know, like a frequently asked questions about the NFTGA insurance. And there's um, sort of a little uh, summary of it, of the insurance. So the main things here so you would be covered for walking or step on tours resulting from self promotion, such as advertising your services on the internet or elsewhere. The key here is that you would not be providing transportation, meals or lodging. So you're not covered if you act as a tour operator. So anything transportation, meals, lodging. Now a lot of you don't do that anyway. Um, I know in the past when I've done it, I didn't do transportation, meals or lodging. But I did do um, subcontractors. So if I had a group of 70 people, I might hire two or three other guides to help me. Um, in, this, in that case, I would not be covered by this insurance. This does not cover you for hiring any kind of subcontractors, for hiring any vendors. So if I get them Betsy Ross tickets and I pay for them and then they reimburse me when I invoice them, then I'm not covered under NT NFTGA insurance. So anything where I'm putting out money, um, even if I'm getting reimbursed by them later, um, and anything where uh, you know I would be doing transportation, meals, or lodging for them. Now I can reserve them, like a you know a spot at Mimi's. That's fine. I would still be covered then for that. If all I did was the tour and reserve a spot at Mimi's for them, but if I took money and from that you know if I paid Mimi and then they paid me back then I'm not covered under the insurance. So I know Bob Levitt likes to say all this insurance gets you is a meeting with a lawyer. But I had um, an insurance guy that I work with look this all over and he said that's not actually true. You do get a little more than that. But it only covers you if you're a tour guide. So and now there is one yeah it says you're considered an independent contractor if you're not generating your own income stream. Generally, a DMC or other entity must pay the bills associated with the tour. Coverage does apply to guides who have been contacted directly by a client and a tour is provided for no more than four people. So on the one-off event that you know you work for Centipede or Philly Tour Hub or Free Tours by Foot, and that you know, and you're mostly covered under their insurance, but this one time or maybe two times somebody contacted you directly that was like a family that you were gonna do a two for tour for and it was no more than four people then the nftga insurance would cover you but basically it's for tour guides who just do tours to have a little bit of extra protection because what could happen is this is again according to the insurance guy i talked to um you know i i could be doing a tour for free tours by foot somebody falls on my tour has some really serious injuries and then they just want to sue everybody so they sue free tours by foot they sue me they sue the city of philadelphia 
maybe if we're on park territory, they, they sue the federal government. And then this just, the NFTG insurance would give me a little bit of, of extra coverage so that you know they, they, they can't go after me. Now, technically I'm covered under free tours by foot anyway, so they really can't, but you know, we're so, we have so much litigation in America now that people just try and sue everybody. I figure let them try and sue me. What are they gonna get from me? My computer and my car, I mean, I don't even own anything. So, but still it's very unpleasant and nobody wants to go through all that law, legal hassles. So if you have the NFTGA insurance, it covers you when you're an independent contractor guide for another company, or if you do a small tour of no more than four people. And if you're not putting out any money of your own. So if I buy Betsy Ross tickets, I buy them Independence Hall tickets. Um, it's pretty much all I do. I, I pay for another guide to help me. Then I no longer can get coverage under this NFTGA insurance. So you kind of have to decide for yourself whether it, you know, whether it's worth it to you. I think that was all that I highlighted on there. And then the other, so that's the, the frequently asked questions part of the, the insurance. Let me stop this. The other thing we have is the general overview. So let me just find that. Oops. I lost you guys. All right, so you can see here that I have down here in yellow. Apologize, it's a little small. Maybe if I can get bigger. Can't see because these other things are blocking me. Anyway, I don't know if you can read this in yellow, but it says, as defined by the policy, a tour operator refers to one who makes any transportation, meal, lodging, or guide arrangements. Other duties include, but are not limited to, hiring and paying vendors for goods or services related to the public for sale. Tour operators are not covered by the policy. So if you do any of those things there in yellow that I just read, you're not covered by the NFTGA policy. So that's why you're not covered for the CUA because the CUA is really looking for the tour operators, right? Not for the actual tour guides. Um, so I don't know if there's going to be more questions on that, but we will keep moving on from there. Just get back my original. Okay. So some insurance options that were found by people um, and let me just start this by, I'm going to jump down to where it says chubbs.com, TC Irons Insurance. That's the real estate guy that I'm working with, and he wasn't able to get back to me in time for today. He did say when I talked to him yesterday that um, he thinks for what I need, if I were to do other tours like this and get insurance, that it would be anywhere, he, he thinks anywhere from five to $900 a year. And I was like, well, you know, if you could get something that was like closer to $500 a year, you know, there might be a bunch of tour guides that would be interested in doing it. So he was going to talk, you know, he was, he was like, I can't promise anything. I don't know, but I'm going to talk to the underwriters or whoever they talk to um, and see what he could do. He also, this insurance guy I talked to has another policy that he does for a group that, that that's also like a member association, like a, a master policy, like we have with NFTGA. So he knows what they are, those kind of group policies like that, and he understands our situation. Maybe he'll come up with something. I'm not promising anything. I have no idea what he'll come back to me with, but I'm hopeful, right? Because I got a hope. I got a hope for something. Um, so what we have so far, and if any of you um, have other insurance that you found at different prices, feel free to to add it in the chat, and we'll discuss it at the end. But there's this RSUI that Reed wrote to me about. He pays about $1,100 a year. 
this Zurich travel agent and tour operators, professional liability insurance, about 800 that Nick pays. I think someone else wrote about the AON one that I 800 that I think is probably that same one that Nick has. And I think Joe wrote to me also about AON. He said about $900. So it looks like that's eight to $900 through AON.com. Uh, this Thimble place I contacted, they gave me a rate of, you know, almost 1200 a year. Although they did ask me whether I needed it um, for a full year. So I'm wondering if it's possible to do it for six months. I mean, if it's a hundred dollars a month and you only had to do six months, if you, you know, if you figure most of your tours are May to September ish, you know, maybe, maybe that's a possibility. I didn't ask them about that. So I'm not sure, but that may be an option. And then I looked into this Hiscox. They didn't have anything for tour people, business insurance, nothing, commercial insurance center, nothing. <laughs> so lots of places were just kind of like, don't, don't even deal with insurance for, for tour guys or um, tour operators. So, and then we'll have more discussion at the end, but these were some of the things that have come up um, with the survey that I sent out and with talking to some people and people have been emailing me some ideas that could maybe improve our situation. So maybe an intermediate monitoring fee from the park service, you know, because from 300 people to 5,000 people is, you know, $1,000. That's a, that's a pretty big jump. Um, if they could, you know, have up to 1,000 people was free, I think that would help some people out, certainly. At least not having to pay that additional $1,000 would be, would be big, right? Um, maybe we can find a, a group policy or some lower insurance policy. Oh, I also, I didn't put in here, did I? Oh, wait, I forgot to say it. Next insurance. I'm sorry, David um, Solstice found one called Next, Next Insurance. And that was, um, I got a quote when I contacted them for 287. I think his was maybe 235 a year. Um, that's for general liability. Subtract, subcontractors are not covered under that one. They just never cover subcontractors. You can't get a rider for it, anything. So if you're someone who does tours that you book directly and they're never so big that you would need an extra guide to hire, um, then this could potentially work for you. Now, you could use a subcontractor with them, but that subcontractor would have to have their own insurance and would have to name you as an additional insured. Um, so you'd have to get someone else at ABT to help you who, you know, who was one of the ones that had the CUA and got the insurance and all that. Um, so that wasn't really ideal for me. I don't know. I may, I may, I'm still deciding what I'm going to do. I haven't decided, but it doesn't cover subcontractors and you, and there's no uh, workers comp and that's called travel guides. That's their, their title for the, for the kind of work we do um, in their system. So that's a possibility for some people. Um, so maybe a lower price for insurance or a group policy, um, maybe a per month fee for insurance. If, if you were getting it, as an, on an as needed basis, you know, maybe four months or six months out of the year, which is when you sort of do your tours. Maybe you don't do any direct bookings in the fall or winter. Um, now I'm going to ask Nick when I'm done to talk about hiring a company with the CUA to sponsor a tour for a fee. Um, and he could talk about, he, I know he's done that a little bit last year or in other years, so he can talk about what he did and, and what that looks like. Um, and he also, what he will do when he has a large tour, he will add on, you'll know, have his, his cost for the tour. And then he adds on like a CUA surcharge and, you know, puts it on, puts that extra cost on the people, on the customers, you know, not on himself. So that's another option. Um, and I think I said to Nick, Nick had asked in the beginning, but some of you weren't on with the survey that I did. Um, so far I have about 50 respondents, at least maybe an hour or two ago before we started this meeting, which is about um, a third of our membership. So I'm hoping we'll get more responses. And let me please say, I know some people asked me this, please fill out the survey if you haven't yet. I am the only one who's seeing the results. And even for me, the, the email addresses are not linked to your answers. Now I could figure out who said which answer, but it would be really time consuming and kind of challenging. So I don't really know who says what. Now, I could figure it out, but what I'm going to do is make a report and then I'm just going to um, delete the original 
info. So it's not going to go to the Park Service. It's not going. It's not going to be for future boards who want to find out who's who's trying to get away without a CUA or anything like that. Um, it's just really because I really want to be able to go to Andrew, the Park Service, or maybe the um, Department of the Interior, if we have to write a letter to them, and I don't know how the best way to do it will be, but whatever advocacy we want to do for ourselves, we have a better chance if we have accurate statistics, like how many of us are actually affected by this, how many of us are actually negatively infected, affected by it, and how many of us are, you know, make enough money that, 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 you know, this is not really desirable, but it's okay, right? I know in 2018, when I did these, I think I made um, $1,600 on my direct booking tours. So if I pay $1,300 to the Park Service, well, I mean between, well, I didn't have, I, only, I would have had only up to 300 people. So 300 for the Park Service and maybe 1,000 for insurance, that would have been 1,300. I would have had like two or $300 that, that I made, right? It's almost not worth my doing it unless I'm really gonna put the effort into advertising and getting a lot of those kinds of tours. Um, in which case then the amount goes up to a thousand dollars, right? So then I'm, I'm still kind of, so it's kind of a balancing act, right? Um, but as far as the survey, please fill it out if you haven't. Uh, I'm the only one who's going to see it. I'm not sharing it with anyone else, only the results, not who said what. And so far we have about half of the members. I can actually, I can actually show you. Let me show you my little, um, Let's see, I did make a screenshot of these. Okay, so you can see the first graph on top. The blue and the red are the people who get either all of their income from tour guiding, that's the blue all or most, and then the red is, you know, tour guiding is part of their income, but it's not their main income source. So you can see it's just about half of the members get income from tour guiding, right? The, um, green is, you know, I don't work as a tour guide. We have a lot of people that just like history, right? And they're not necessarily tour guides, or maybe they used to and don't anymore. And then the yellow is um, most of the tour guiding work I do is unpaid, right? So we have a lot of the volunteer docents and things. But the bottom, the red and the blue, about half of the membership get income from tour guiding. And then the bottom graph, um, the biggest is the red. Sometimes people hire me directly to lead tours, but it's not the majority of my work. And then the blue is that the majority of the work is getting direct booking for tours. So of the half of our membership who do get income from tour guiding, you know, about 80% are affected by the CUA basically do do direct booking tours at least some of the time now this doesn't take into account whether or not they go into Independence National Park but the majority of us do right because that's the big attraction in Philadelphia so so it it's a you know if, if, if the third who answered can be extrapolated to all 153 of us then um, you know then it's kind of a lot of people affected. So the more accurate statistics I can have that I can make a case like, look, this is negatively affecting 50 people or, you know, 50% of our membership or whatever it is, I can have a, I can have a number to share with, with them that's, that's accurate. Um, because we know, well, I should say, maybe you all don't know, that kind of why this started, at least what we've been told or what I understand, is that, you know, out west, say um, Grand Canyon or Yellowstone, you know, they have these big entrance gates and they charge the buses that come in, they would charge them this CUA fee. Um, but since here in the Independence Park, it needs money, we don't have a big gate to get in or a big parking lot where they can charge or anything like that. Um, so now they're doing, you know, this, this CUA with the, with the tour guides. They're, and that their main, um, who they mainly want to, um, you know, pay these CUAs are these big tour operators, those big, I mean, some of those buses that come in really do get over 5,000 people a year that they bring in, you know, these big companies that just bring lots and lots of tourists in. You know, we're just small potatoes for them, right? But they just have these sort of across the board guidelines, not taking into account whether you're a one person tour company or you're getting, you know, 20,000 people a year coming through. So, uh, so I don't know, that's what I have to share. <laughs>
<laughs> so now I don't feel super, I feel a little bit hopeful. Um, and Andrew was very, um, he, he is very collaborative, at least when I was talking to him, he seemed like he really wants to help and he seems like he really doesn't want to screw us. Um, so, but I mean, he's not going to say, you know, yeah, don't get the CUA. And I mean, obviously he can't say that he's not going to tell us that. And he, you know, he doesn't know always what all the Rangers are doing, how well they're checking out there or not. They're, they're supposed to be checking that we have CUAs when we're on park property. So I'm sorry, Andrew is the, um, I don't know what maybe Nick knows what his actual position title is, but he's the one who's in charge of the CUA program with the park service. So he's the one that we're dealing with when we get the CUA and, and his staff. So Nick, do you have, would you like to add anything, clarify anything, or if, if not, we can go directly to questions and maybe you can answer questions, whatever you think. If, if I had $10 time, I had to talk about this topic in the last 10 years. Insurance. Real, I'll try to keep it quick. The insurance grew over years and the, those questions in the QA came after people asked a specific question of the insurance company. It's a, it's, as Levitt likes to say, it's kind of a shaky policy. Never been a claim filed an entire time. There's a $3 million aggregate for claims in any given policy year. You know, the, to me, the big difference is if they're issuing this policy and they're not doing any risk assessment. If you buy a regular liability insurance, they're going to pepper you with a bunch of questions. Tours do you do? Do you do this kind of tour? Do you do that kind of tour? Of course, I try to figure out how much they're on the hook for. Under the uh, NFTGA policy, there's none of that going on. I mean, it's everybody's personal choice. That's just the way I do it. The limit used to be a thousand before you paid, before they raised it to five thousand. Uh, and I don't, I don't really. Did he really say that the IBC was covered? That you needed an IBC, uh, CUA to go through the IBC? I, you know, I, he I didn't say like, that. That's just on the website when they list all of the sites that are park service sites. Yeah, I would, I would question that. The same is same with the bus terminal. But uh, uh, what else? The funny thing is, if a teacher if a teacher gives the, they don't they don't have to have a CUA. So uh, this also covers uh, OTAs. You know, if you if you get tours through TripAdvisor, get your guide or tours by locals. You need to have a CE, as far as I'm concerned, you need to have a CUA. Uh, the reason this wasn't, a, they're starting to enforce the CUA this year. And the first, before COVID, people took advantage of, I guess, a loophole enforcement. You could get a, you could get a CUA from company A. And then if you did a, a tour for company B, you show company A CUA. The park service has been typically asked to check for that this year. Andrew considers that fraud, by the way. So that's, I don't know. Uh, you know, you gave those uh, chart breakdowns of who does, who does what for whom. An additional interesting point to think about is I wrote an article a few years ago for the National that talks about the three types of tour guides. You know, some do it because uh, it's part of their basic income. Some do it because it supplements their regular income and lets them take cruises or other vacations. And others do it just for the hell of it. And they really all, all three of those groups have slightly different needs. That's just, that's an aside. That's pretty much all I have to say, but I'll be glad to answer any questions. So I'll go through the questions on chat and then um... And then we'll take other questions. You can put them in the chat or raise your hand, but I'm going to go through the chat ones first since they've been uh, sitting here for a few minutes. Um, so Rich asks, is a CUA required if you give a tour without expectation of compensation? Um, and then Nick answered, I think that's a question for Andrew, as, as would be the related question as to whether mural arts counts as a commercial entity. Uh, yeah, so the, I mean, it's a commercial usage authorization and on the, on the website, it says if you're bringing commercial tours into the park. So yeah, I'll ask Andrew that. I have to have another call with Andrew that he's supposed to call me back today, but he didn't, but I'll ask him that too. My guess is if you're not getting paid, then it's not commercial. That, that, that's just my opinion. <laughs> so I don't know what, 
we'll have to ask Andrew that one. Um, and then Nick says the difference was $125 when they dropped the limit after he paid for the million. So when you mean when you went from a million to 500,000 on the insurance. Right, right, right. I was, I was one of the few got the million before they dropped it. Well, then that's good. 125. That's, I mean, that's helpful. That's better. Uh, Vance asks, my question is on national parks property, namely is the property only inside the sidewalks or does the sidewalk, for example, the red brick sidewalk at the base of independence mall count as national parks property. Obviously, walking through Washington Square would be on the property, but what about the sidewalk surrounding the square? Is it a definite yes or no answer, no sidewalks or ice, all sidewalks, or is it a case-by-case -case basis? I don't know, Nick, what do you think? I don't know. I think it's, in, if you're in the, pro the sidewalk would not be considered part of the property, unless you're talking about the sidewalk in front of Independence Hall. They might, they might scrap that, but I can't see them charging and if you're just walking, if you're just walking by the Todd House, uh, the, yeah, yeah. If you're walking by the Bishop White House or something like that, 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 that you need you. Right? Before we get, in case you're out of time, I want to answer this one question about: uh, Are they interrupting tours? Yes, they will chat. Their their uh, teachers have been instructed to look for a CUA, and if you don't have one, in the case of Independence Hall. They'll let you go through, but they won't let you in. And they're taking and they're taking names. The idea being, uh, this is essentially a warning. If you come back a couple months later without a CUA, you could be subject to a significant fine. So, I don't know how long they're going to keep that up, but I think that's important to know. Um, and I, so I, through this question with Vance, I think as Vance, I did that to you talk about where you walk around Washington Square on the outside. Um, I don't, I, I think you would be fine with that. I mean, it's my, I mean, when I talked to Andrew, he was like, look, we're not, we're not trying to like, you know, screw everybody. And, and I can't imagine that a group, you know, like the only thing you do is around Washington Square at that one fountain there. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I personally, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about it, but I can't tell you what to do, right? But um, if that's the only thing you do anywhere near the park, at least the tour that I did with you, I wouldn't think that would be a big problem. Um, and you could always call, and Andrew said he's happy to answer questions and he's happy to talk to us. So you can send questions to me because I'm going to talk to him next this week or he might get back to me next week. So you can send me questions and I can do a report about what he said or you can try and contact him directly. He's very, um, you know, very much wants to work with us and help. So, you know, and he said, he said, I've talked to Nick, I've talked to Reed. Um, he's talked to Josh Silver, like he's taught, you know, he knows the guides that he, you know, have the CUAs that he's talked to and stuff. So he, he does want to work with us. Um, Rich asks, how do we obtain a copy of the NFTGA insert insurance certificate? Nick answered, Bob Levitt sends out a, a certificate. Yeah, Bob has a certificate that he would send out to you that, that you would use then. Um, Yeah, so Nick says, says, thanks, Nick. Should I contact him? Yeah, so Bob Levitt should send it to you when you uh, when you pay for your insurance. So if you don't have it, then then ask him for it. But yeah, the actual policy is, is never made available to us mere mortals. Um, is it possible that APT could serve as an umbrella to see you see you a designation? Um, we talked about this at the board meeting, and I'm pretty sure we talked about this back when in the board when the CUA was first introduced. Um, and I don't remember exactly what the reason then was why we weren't able to do it. I think the Park Service didn't accept it back then. But at any rate, now we're getting um, our legal status of 50, I think it's 501C6, and we would not be able to do it under our new legal status at least according to Judy. I don't know much about the new status, but that's what Judy said, um, that we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, does the Independence National Historical Park CUA policy differ from other national historic parks like in Boston, New York, or DC? Um, that I don't know. Do you know that, Nick? I think I answered. As far as I know, they don't. those three cities don't have any parks that require CUA. So we're first on the list on the East Coast. This is maybe sort of urban experiment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help us. It's, so there's no commons we can go to and say, you know, in uh, Washington they're doing this and so forth. 
And I started to write a question, answer to Patrick's question about the, why don't they just check the CUAs on the motor coaches? Well, they have, they have staffing issues. They don't have the park police to do that. So what they're doing is having them, the guy go to Liberty Bell, you know, who, or who's showing you the liberal is charged with checking for your CUA. The sort of extra work they gave them. They're not happy about it either, by the way. Uh, okay, so Karis is asking, is there insurance for independent tour guides who are giving tours for more than four people, but not arranging food, transportation, lodging, etc. So yeah, so that's what that's what we're looking at, right? Those are the, the examples I gave at the bottom with that Reed has and Nick has and that that David Solstice found and um, and that I'm looking into those would be for people who are arranging tours, maybe getting tickets, um, maybe reserving a lunch place, maybe hiring a sub subcontractor guide and, and giving the tour. And that would basically it. So that's what those insurance examples that I gave at the bottom. That's what that's what that insurance would would be for. Um, yeah, Nick, I'm pretty sure right the NFTGA. I mean, it does say if you do a tour that you're hired just to do the tour and you're not doing anything else, then you would be covered. It's an interpretation somebody made of what the policy says. I personally don't think that it covers anybody, you know, who's acting as a tour operator, whether or whether it's being paid for the tour, whether or not they're providing anything else. So that's, does that make sense? No. In other words, the okay let me try that again if you're if you're being paid for a tour then you're a tour operator uh, these little exceptions that the tga policy carves out i don't hold up but that's just that's just my that was my own personal evaluation you, you may have a different opinion but now now does it make sense there was a note uh in what marianne showed that specified for individuals who were not doing transportation, food, or lodging, but it was limited to four tour operators, for, or to, excuse me, to only four guests. That was on something that Marianne showed, which was a, a bit of a surprise to me. Well, it's it's kind of hard to really explain how loose this uh, AQ was put together. That was a question somebody asked the agent, and I think they went and asked the company a few years ago. So, like, and I think one of the People that was on the board a long time said, you know, if we ask too many questions, they're going to look at this policy and just uh, seriously, they're not going to be that, they're not going to be interested in, you know, and continue to provide it. I think the whole premium is like five grand a year, which isn't in the insurance business, isn't really that much, that much of income. So, so the bottom line is we don't actually know because there's never been a claim on an NFTGA policy. Right. But it looks like from the material that we were given, you could make a case either way for it, but since it's never happened, we're not sure what the insurance company would decide. The real key is whether you can add the additional insurance on the certificate. I'll bet you if you ask the insurance company that question directly, the answer is gonna be some clean variation of the NFTGA. You know, no way. Oh, the answer is going to be no. No. Yeah. Because going back to my original point about the risk, why would we take on that much risk? When, when they do individual policies, they're asking us all these questions. I know some people want to hear, and I, I can sympathize. You only do a few tours a year. I don't, not exactly, I'm luxuriating in private tours. I just made a business decision that this is the way it is. So I might as well bite it. Okay. Um, Karis, do you go on Independence Park territory at all? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, no, I've worked my way around it without going onto the park. And I like excuse them to go to Independence Hall and then I meet up with them again or to go to Liberty Bell and then I meet up with them again and so forth. That's, that's a good answer, by the way, because I do step ons. We're a company that we do the step on around the city in the bus, and then we release them and let them go to the Liberty Bell on their own. So 
for that, I don't need to see. I don't need to see your. Because I'm thinking for CARES, right? Like the the NFTGA insurance is not sufficient to get a CUA. If for no other reason, then then we can't put the additional insured on it. I'm um, not interested in a CUA. Right, right. but if you don't yeah. need the CUA, yes. the NFTGA insurance could still be good for you. It's just we're not exactly sure because there, there's never been a claim on it, right? And and the the language we have, I mean, even my insurance guy said your your language and your frequently asked questions and in your overview is a little bit contradictory and a little bit confusing. So you could probably, you know, if something were to happen, you could probably make a case like why they should insure you, but the insurance company could decide whatever they wanted, right? I mean, we, we don't really know how they would decide. I do so that's have what we're insurance. Uh, I was surprised to find it was limited to four. So, thank you. Yeah, my insurance guy thought it was probably just like they're really covering independent contractors who just need a little bit of extra assurance. Um, and then on the, you know, on the one-off tour that this, independent contractor guide might do one or two little tours then they would cover that but that's not really a realistic you know for most of us if, if we're doing direct hire tours um all right let me just go through these and see if there's any before i get to uh rich uh see this really good article yeah and then nick answered that about the market okay so anyone else, if you can either put anything else in chat or you can raise your hand there. It's just hard. I can't see everybody because I'm recording it. So just raise if you rate if you use the raise hand function, I can actually see you to call on you. So go ahead, Rich. So I, I hate to be asking so many questions and maybe this is parsing uh, some of the conversation. But the tours that I do that are independent it might be like a wedding group. Uh, and I don't know if they're going to pay me or not. They may or may not. And I never go into any of the buildings. I'm just around John Barry's statue or in Franklin Court. Do I need a CUA for that? I guess Andrew would say technically yes, but uh, I'm thinking maybe not. I don't know. What do you think, Nick? I don't know. Like he said, they would. If you ask him, they would say yes. And I guess <clears throat> the idea of are you doing the that. They're looking if you're doing a volunteer tour, you're not doing an, an expectation of tips. I mean, is a question. I mean, do they generally tip or do they generally not tip? Are you doing this for fun? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to answer that, but that's that's what they're uh, that's probably what they would ask. See, well, I won't know whether I'm getting a tip or not until the very end of the tour. So, you know, up until that point, it's volunteer. But do you have an expectation of getting? Are they going to look into my soul? <laughs> no, no, but I'm, that, that's what defines that's what defines the answer, I think. Well, you know, I, I I used to I used to be a park ranger one time, and uh, that was last they, century. They have what they call permits, so you can get a permit uh, to do various activities, photograph things, things like that, filming, and then of course nobody will question. Anything else you don't I don't you don't need a CUA to get a permit. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you know nobody gets a permit these they all use they all use Alpha Sally photography. Most weddings don't bother to get me. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Does anyone else have um, suggestions, ideas of, um, you know, ways that might make this a little more palatable for, you know, the small company, one person, two person tour companies? Anyone have other ideas other than what, you know, what I kind of said? Are you raising your hand again? I don't know if your hand is raised again or if it was the yes. same one. If, if, if. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If it's true in Philadelphia, why isn't it true in New York? Why isn't it true in Boston? Maybe, maybe that is a little bit of leverage that could be laid at Andrew's feet. I'm sure that he, you know, is subject to a whole bureaucracy, but you know, it, it's fair is fair. Well, I don't know, is that going to help us much if all the other cities have to pay it too? <laughs> then they might get more entrenched in the in the way they do things. 
well, maybe they'll relax us, uh, relax on us a little bit more. Right. Three more. I think we have the concentration because of the size of the, you know, the number of things that are in the physical boundaries, whereas in places like New York and DC, they're sort of, they're more spread out. Whether would they, you know, I don't know how they would get one umbrella, CUA for all that stuff. Those different parks. It really is a tremendous burden, even for those who want to are willing to get a CUA. I mean, it's a tremendous burden. What do you have to do to make up that cost? It almost eliminates just a um, an individual who has a love and an interest in Philadelphia and the history, and just wants to offer an occasional tour. Um, it's just financially not feasible. It's hard to argue with that. You know, the question is, you know. People, some people do a private tour for a hundred bucks. Some people do a private tour for 500 bucks. So it really, it really does matter. As far as the person willing to get the CUA, they have, their own, they have to make their own decision. I think a small operator, I wouldn't give people this as advice, but I can't see how they're gonna go after small people, small operators. The worst thing is you, you went into Independence Hall or Liberty Bell in that gym. They're not going to go around and people like a, like somebody's looking for overtime parking. Money. And Andrew did say to me, he's like, I mean, because I was kind of like, you know, this is really prohibitive for like smaller operators, and you know, maybe we could have an intermediate step or something with the with the fine schedule, or with you know the fees. And he did say he was like, look, you know, there, there's some people who are in Independence Hall every day. And then there's some people who we might see five times in the summer. He's like, we're not, we're not like, you know, going after these, like, we're not trying to go after these small operators. We're really, you know, we're really looking at the people who, who use the park a lot, you know, these tour operators. So that's kind of how he phrased it to me, which take what, you know, make of it what you will. I mean, he can't, he can't say like, you know, I mean, they have rules that they have to follow. Um, but they're not as interested in, you know, someone that they see once a month. That is, you know, there's certain people, certain guys that they just see, you know, over and over all the time. I don't know, but those are the people probably working for a company that have a CUA from their company anyway. So, um, does anyone else have other insurance that they found that was um, other than the ones that were named? How did you find this one, Nick, the AON one? Just, uh, I find everything else. I Googled it. Just Googling. <laughs> so, yeah. And I know there are guys in other cities that have the same that have policy. I mean, they have a market. They have an, you can fill out all the information online. So this isn't the one of type thing. I'm sure it all quite a few of them. Hmm. Any other thoughts before we before we wrap up? If there's anything. Any final uh, final comments from anybody? Well, thank, well, thank you, thank you. I, I, I certainly have some food for thought, you know, and uh, maybe even some soul searching. So thank you. Well, and if any of you would like, I mean, I am going to write up something to present to Andrew, whether, you know, written or, I mean, hopefully you can go talk to him. If anybody was, is interested in doing that with me, you know, at least, you know, in whatever capacity, helping me edit it, helping me write it, um, going to see Andrew, um, you know, if any of you get other ideas later on in the week when you're in the shower or washing dishes, that's usually when I get mine. Um, you know, feel free to email me and we'll, you know, we'll see what we can, what we can come up with. Um, yeah. So think about it to be continued. Yes. Thank you, Marianne. It was a great job. You're welcome. I wish I had more, more concrete good news, but all we can do is, you know, try and understand the situation and then see what we could possibly you know, where we might be able to affect a change. Maybe. 
All right, nobody else? Okay. All right, well, book club is at seven. Any of you interested in book club? So that'll be a different Zoom. So look for that on the website or in Judy's email. And uh, I'm going to stop this recording and talk to you all soon.